who has that hope in himself purifies himself. That hope of when Jesus will come and take us uh, away is what purifies us, keeps us clean, keeps us on target, uh, keeps us on our purpose. And so it uh, looks like uh, many of you uh, took my word to heart. I said if you heard the first part of the message, you had to come back <laughs> today to hear the second part. This is the second part of the message that we began last week on uh, focusing on our purpose. Paul uh, really focused on his purpose. And, you know, I picked up that phrase that was uh, popularized or a few years ago, a book that was written, A Purpose-Driven Life. Uh, our lives should be on purpose. Our, 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 uh, one of the things that we as human beings uh, desire is to have significance. And the way to have significance is to have purpose. And our purpose, we're learning what that is as followers of Christ. Uh, we've looked at um, four of them. Uh, there's eight different, uh, I would call them, aspects, principles that together define Paul's purpose in life and, uh, and ours as well as Christ followers. And we dealt, we're going to deal with the last four of them today, but last Sunday, if you remember, the first one was become totally thankful. Paul was thankful. He, he, he started out saying, I'm thank you for all of y'all. That's how we'd say it here in, in Mississippi, is uh, for all of y'all. I'm thankful. Uh, we should be totally thankful. The second, uh, uh, aspect or principle of living a purpose-filled life is to give people something to talk about. And they, their faith, uh, even though Paul had never met them, the, the Christians in Rome, their faith was being talked about all over the world at that time. And uh, we learned that, you know, the gospel is spreading all around the world. It's amazing to hear um, on the radio and pick up on the internet all the things that God is doing in so many parts of the world. I mean, even in communist China, it's still... Uh, believe it or not, in communist China, people living under communism, the Christian faith is growing faster than it is anywhere in, in the world. And uh, even, even in the Middle East, in Muslim countries, the underground church is growing. Uh, we need to pray especially for Afghanistan, continue to pray because we know that uh, there was a strong underground church there, but we don't really know what's going on there. A lot of reports have come out that most of the Christians have been martyred, but we don't know. But God is at work, and uh, so give people something to talk about. The third thing is to serve Christ uh, half-heartedly. Okay, I was, was going to see if y'all were still awake. Yeah. Uh, serve Christ wholeheartedly, with our whole heart, and then we learn that we're to persevere in our prayers uh, praying for one another. But we come to the fifth one this morning as we get started. Develop a mutual ministry. Notice what he says here in verses 11 and 12 as I read a moment ago. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Uh, we need to develop a mutual ministry ministry. This word long really means I yearn, I, I have a yearning in my heart to, to, to see you. To, it's, it's yearning for someone. And when Paul thought about the Christians at Rome, his heart literally ached. Uh, he said, I, I just want to come and see you. Uh, we, knew, we know that he knew some of the people in Rome, even though he had never been to Rome, because Priscilla and Aquila, uh, some fellow missionaries, were there already. We learned that from Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And Acts chapter 18, verses 18 and 9, he said, uh, He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy. Where is Rome? <coughs> Italy. From Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. And so we know that Paul knew those two. It also goes on to say that so Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and he sailed to Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him and he had his hair cut off at Century for he had uh, taken a vow and he came to Ephesus and Paul left them there but he himself entered in the synagogue and began to uh, preach or reason with the Jews. So Paul knew them. Uh, Romans 16 verse 13 Excuse me, verse, uh, chapter 16, when we get there, verse 3, says, Greet 
Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. So Paul knew some people, even though he had not been there to Rome, and he, he, he wanted to go and be with them. Uh, he was uh, most excited. Why was he excited? Because he wanted to help them. He wanted to make them stronger, he says, uh, that we will be mutually uh, encouraged by one another. Uh, he, he, he saw that, that uh, he, he was strengthened when others were strengthened. He was encouraged when others were encouraged. That reminds me of, of the story of the father of modern-day missions. We, we call him uh, William Carey, the, the cobbler. Uh, that's a shoemaker, by the way, not, not you know, <laughs> blackberry cobbler. Uh, but but uh, I'm not supposed to be telling jokes because someone said that they hurt their ribs. <laughs> Okay, but uh, we, we, you know, William Carey, the founder of Modern Day Missions, when he was about to board the ship, uh, even though it had taken him three years to get ready and to go to India to begin his missionary career there, some of his friends came and they asked him if he wanted to go through with it. We know you, they said, we know you've been planning this, we've been praying for you, we've been also helping you raise support, and we know you, but do you still want to go through with this? And uh, expressing his great desire for for their support in prayer, this is what William Carey said. I will go down into the pit itself if you will hold the ropes. I will go down in the pit if you will hold the ropes. You know, that's what we do for our missionaries. They're, they're going down into the pit, and we're holding the ropes. In support, we're giving our money, we're giving our prayer, we're lifting up in prayer. And, and so if we're... One of our purposes, the principles of, of our purpose as a Christ follower is to have a mutual ministry. Uh, to put it bluntly is, uh, let's all admit something today. We all need encouragement. <laughs> Amen? Let's all say that. We all need encouragement. I need encouragement. You need encouragement. And as we um, minister, as we serve in tandem, uh, God is, is, is exalted, God is honored, people are served, and we end up being encouraged. Don't, don't you love to hear uh, stories of how God is at work in people's lives? Uh, Brother David was sharing a little bit in Sunday school. Uh, how God is at work. He, he shared about a, a lady that really had an influence on his life, how God worked in her life, and, and, and by, almost by herself, but of course as a help, she came out of a cult. As a, she grew up in the home of a cult, and yet she read the Word of God, and God drew her out of it. God, God is a great, our God is a great God, and, and uh, He energizes us through uh, encouragement. Who can you encourage today? Think of somebody today that's not here. Think of someone that uh, you know needs a word of encouragement, and go out of these doors in a little while and get on the phone or go visit them and, and put your arm around them or at least uh, do your best to encourage them in the Lord. Develop a mutual... We're in, we're in this together, folks. Uh, I want to thank those of you who stepped up while I was gone uh, that month. I know it meant that some of you had to do a, a lot more than you normally do, but uh, thank you. We ha this is a mutual ministry. This is just not a one-person act, folks. We're to develop a mutual ministry. Uh, that's part of our purpose in life. The next thing, the, the sixth thing we, we learn is allow your plans to be interrupted. <laughs> Brother Joe. <laughs> oh, that's tough. You know, allow your plans to be interrupted. Notice what Paul says in verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. Paul says, you know, I, I had this plan, <laughs> and I was going to come there to Rome, but it got interrupted. Uh, some people probably wonder why Paul had not yet come to Rome, because it was, you know, that was his strategy. He would go to these very important cities and start churches, and then from there the gospel would go out. And he had never been to Rome. It was the, it was the, where Caesar lived. It was the, it was the number one city of that day. And he wants them to know that it's not because he hadn't prayed and not because he hadn't planned to go there. He had prayed. He had planned to go there. But God had not yet made a way for him to go. 
Uh, listen to Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. And when these things were accomplished, the Bible says that Paul purposed in the Spirit. Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After that I have been there, what? I must also see Rome. Paul had a plan. Uh, he, he, was, he wanted to go to Rome, but it hadn't worked out. His plans had been interrupted. And uh, he returns to this idea, uh, as we will see in Romans 15, 23, uh, when he says this, But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years, I'm coming to you. I'm coming. And, of course, we know Paul did make it to Rome eventually, but it was in God's timing. You see, again, his reason for wanting to go to Rome was to take part in God's harvest. That's why he wanted to. It's, it's to be a part of God's harvest. All of us want to be a part of God. This is harvesting time, by the way, folks. What did Jesus say? Remember, his disciples were kind of down. And Jesus said one day, look on the fields. What? They're ripe unto harvest. Folks, there's people out there. Did you know that God has already prepared some of the people that you know, maybe somebody on your street, somebody in your, in your sphere of influence? He's already prepared their hearts. All you have to do is just go and, 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 and just pick the fruit. It's there. He wanted some harvest. That's why he wanted to go to Rome. His ministry was an unending quest to gather the fruit of changed lives, and that was what he was about. Most, most people believe that Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this letter to the Romans. And it's interesting that Paul eventually does when he gets to Rome, but he gets there not in the way that he planned it. <laughs> because we know that he ended up getting to Rome, Brother Dave, as a prisoner. And he was, uh, spent time in a Roman jail. But he knew and recognized that this was God's plan for him because he says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 13, so that, he said, I'm here in Philippi, but, or I'm here in Rome, but he wrote to, to the Philippians, he says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that I'm here in this prison. I'm, my chains are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm here because I'm a follower of Christ. And as a result, it became clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else, Paul says that I'm in chains for Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this morning. How do you handle it when your plans get interrupted? <laughs> you get frustrated I think that's pretty normal for most of us. Allow your plans to be interrupted. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's part of our purpose. Is, is God, God, God has, we, we have a plan sometimes, don't we? And, and we pray, and, and, but really, ultimately, it's God's purpose. It's God's plans that will prevail, the Bible says. Uh, I don't score very high on this either. I, um, but let's remember the truth. What uh, prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 55, uh, verse 8, he says, God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. God has a plan. And when God interrupts our plans, it's so that his purpose will ultimately prevail. Amen? So uh, we need to be okay with that. But I want to ask again, are you okay with it? Are you okay when God interrupts your Allow your plans, plans to be interrupted. Uh, a seventh thing is um, live out your debt, or your, I'll use a better word, obligation. Live out your obligation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul in verse 14. I am debtor. I, I have a debt, Paul says. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul felt uh, he was morally obligated to get the good news of the gospel out to everyone. That's what drove him. Talking about purpose-driven, that's what drove his life. His one, his one consuming passion in life was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people. Somebody say that, to all people. 
to all people. The gospel is for everybody. It's not just for a bunch of uh, just select few. Paul's heart was, I want to get the gospel. I want to preach the gospel to all people, to everyone. Irregardless of their culture, irregardless of their education, irregardless of their religious background or, or, or whatever. We see this also in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 and 17. This is what Paul says. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe, and Paul says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Folks, Paul was eager to, to preach. He was ready. He was willing. He was able. His number one aim, his number one purpose was to do uh, God's work, period. That was it, period. There was nothing more. Let me ask you this morning. What are you eager about? What are you eager to do as a Christ follower? Or let's go back to our hymn, Brother Joe. What are you living for? Why? Uh, who are you living for? Living for Jesus. That's the question God has for all of us. Who am I living for? Who am I living this life for? Well, if we're a Christ follower, it'd be, it should be for Jesus and his message to get out there. The answer to these questions, I believe, will tell you more than you might want to know about yourself. <laughs> Amen. Only God's word and God's people are going to last forever, so make sure you're investing your life in that which is going to last for eternity. Was it C.T. Studd who said only one life <laughs> will soon be passed? Only what's done for Christ will last. Live out your obligation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, the eighth, when we think about our purpose as Christ followers, do not or don't be ashamed of the gospel. Let's all say that together. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Of the gospel. Of the gospel. Listen to Paul. For I am not ashamed, verse 16, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. That's the word dynamite. We get our word dynamite. It is the dynamite of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. These are some of the most life uh, changing, transforming truths that were ever uh, written down in. God's Word. Uh, this not only serves as the theme and the thesis of the rest of the book of Romans, as we're going to see, but it also is, is just a, 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 a concise summary of the gospel message. It is our mandate, Brother David, to share the gospel with the world. Uh, the word here, ashamed, is a very interesting word. It, it, it actually can have, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed, it, it, in, the, it, in the original language, it can have two meanings. One meaning is to be red-faced. <laughs> That's what we normally think of being ashamed. You know, you're ashamed, you turn, your red, face turns red. That's one meaning. And the other meaning refers to being disappointed. It can't actually mean to be disappointed. Paul, Paul says, I'm not red-faced, and I am not disappointed in the gospel, Brother Jerry. I am not disappointed. You see... As I studied for this message, my eyes were opened this week to think about, think about the Apostle Paul. The, the shame that he must have felt when he looked back over the many years of his life before he came to Jesus Christ. I mean, he was a chief persecutor. He, he chased down Christians, put them in jail, so, had some of them killed. He, he was there when the first... So, long, so, 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 so far as we know from the Bible, the first martyr. Remember Stephen? The deacon? Deacon Stephen? He was there when Deacon Stephen was, was stoned to death and Paul was holding the, the clothes, the cloaks of the people who were throwing the stones. Can you think about it? The shame that Paul must have felt. 
Well, I was uh, reading Dr. Nishimoto, a, a therapist at the Menrith Meyer Clinic uh, there in Wheaton, Illinois. This is what uh, she said when she was uh, trying to analyze, you know, what Paul was going through when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and, and, and thinking about his past. Here's what she said. Paul had led a crusade to kill. He must have felt unworthy of God's grace. He must have struggled with the intense self-loathing in his own heart. He, he faced a dilemma. Would he, would he deeply embrace God's truth of redemption and forgiveness? We don't know for sure. She says the Bible doesn't give us all the details, but can't you just imagine the inner pain that Paul felt the first time he passed that spot where he had <laughs> condoned the stoning of Stephen? She said, I would imagine that Paul would cast his eyes to the ground and bit his lip a little bit in pain and sorrow for what he had done. She said he might have just ducked into an alley and wept bitterly when he thought about it. Or maybe after laying down at night, he said, I could imagine him seeing the glowing face of Stephen as he was being stoned. Because it said his, his face glowed like the glory of Jesus. But we know, don't we, that Paul eventually resolved his guilt and his shame by seeing himself as God saw him. <laughs> forgiven and clean. Somebody say forgiven and clean. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christ follower, let me tell you this morning, you're forgiven. You're clean. You've been washed. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all your sin. You are forgiven. You're, it, it probably came to him the same way that it comes to all of us uh, slowly, doesn't it? Kind of slowly. In fits and in starts. Well, we might have some fear of the way others may see us. I think some of us do at times. But you know the most important thing in life as a Christ follower is to embrace the way that God sees us. Yes, we're sinners, but did you know God looks at you today? <laughs> he doesn't see a sinner anymore. In the end, we must give God and not others the right to define who we are. That's why Paul could say in Romans 10, 11, he says, anyone who trusts in Christ will never be put to shame. Don't be ashamed. Don't be red-faced faced of the gospel. Don't be disappointed. That's what he says here. Once we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no reason to be ashamed. There's no, we have no valid reason to ever be disappointed by God. Listen to Isaiah. In Isaiah 49, verse 23, this is what the prophet says. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers, you shall, they shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth. Folks, we, we're a child. You're a child of God. Linda, you're a child of God. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of God. Don't be ashamed. Of, and he lists at least three or four. Let's, let's look at three. He lists three reasons why he's not ashamed. First of all, he says why? Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. The, the gospel is all-powerful. Folks, when we share our faith, when we share the gospel, it's not, it's not our uh, words, it's, it's not our personalities, it's not, it's, even, like, it's not the way I preach, it, it's none of that. The gospel, the message of the gospel, in that message is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. That's where the power is. It's in the gospel. And that's why... Uh, we don't need to be ashamed. Many of us are not plugged in to, to God's power. And we're not experiencing the, the explosive dynamite of the gospel message in our lives. Matthew twenty two twenty nine, Jesus answered and said to them, 
said, you're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures. What? You know, the power of God. God can save anybody, folks. God can save the worst of sin. That's, that's, that's really what Paul said. I think he came to, after thinking about all that he had done against the he said, I'm the chief of sinners. And God saved him. God, the power of the gospel. That's the first reason we should. When the gospel is grasped, God's power is unleashed in people's lives. 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 18. For the message of the cross, get this, 2021, for the message of the cross, the message of our, the cross of Jesus, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are what? Perishing. But to us who are being saved, what is it? It's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. The first reason we shouldn't be ashamed is, is it's all powerful. Secondly, the gospel is for every person. Notice it says, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew and also to the Gentile. The gospel is for everybody. You know, we're going to see as we go through the book of Romans, we're going to see this great doctrine of what we call the justification, which tells us that you and I, as Christ followers, have been delivered from the penalty of sin. We are no longer held guilty. But we are acquitted of our crimes against a holy God because of what Jesus has done. We've been justified. Those who are profoundly unrighteous are profoundly made righteous. <laughs> We're justified because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. That's why he says, and he's going to say in the ver chapter 8 and verse 1, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. There's no condemnation. We've been justified. Our guilt, our rebellion has been taken away. We've been given grace. We, we, have become, we have been given righteousness. Not our own, but it's from Christ. We've been justified. And then we're going to learn about sanctification. What's that word? We're, we're delivered not only from the penalty of sin, but we're delivered from the power of sin, Brother David. And while sin is, is not totally eradicated in our lives... We still sin, it's not totally, we no longer have to live in bondage to it. We don't have, we can say no. When you're not a follower of Christ and uh, you get tempted, <laughs> you can't say no because you don't have any power in you. But if you're a follower of Christ, you can say no. We're not in bondage to sin. We, we, we're being sanctified. We're, we're, we're becoming more like Jesus as the Holy Spirit is allowed to work in our lives in tandem with the Word of God as we read it and as we study it and as we become more and more like Jesus. We are sanctified. Romans uh, 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Paul says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it. And then we're going to get to that magnificent doctrine here in the book of Romans. Uh, justification, sanctification, glorification. Hallelujah. <laughs> not only are believers set free from the penalty of sin, not only are we set free from the power of sin, but eventually we will be delivered, hallelujah, from the very presence of sin. When we leave this earth... <laughs> And spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be delivered from the very presence of sin. Hallelujah. That's what heaven's like. No sin. We'll be glorified, the Bible puts it. God will finish the work that he began when he justified us. Listen to Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time and some of us are suffering, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The final reason, not only should we not be ashamed because the gospel is all-powerful and because the gospel is for everybody, but the gospel is received by faith alone. Faith alone. That's what it says. Just believing it literally means, you know what the word believe means? means to lean on. 
leaning, I think, think of that hymn, leaning on Jesus. Le that's what the word believe here means. It's, it's to lean. Um, this was the cry of the Reformation. Amen. Sole vida. Vida. Faith alone. And Martin Luther, 500 years ago, took his stand on this very verse when he declared, he said, unless therefore I am convinced by the testimony of scripture or by the clearest reasoning, I cannot, I will not retract, because they were telling him you've got to uh, retract what you've said and what you nailed on that door, those 95 theses. They were, they were brought him before the court. They said, you must retract it. He said, I am convinced by the testimony of scripture, by the clearest reasoning, I cannot, I will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. And then we're told, history tells us, that he looked around in that room at those people who literally held his life in, his, in their hands. They, they, they could execute him. This is what Martin Luther said. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. <laughs> and that's what started the Protestant Reformation. That was a... The spark, that was the match that lit the fire for the Protestant Reformation. Faith must involve our mind and our heart and most importantly our will. We are to lean on Jesus. We have to move from the knowledge about the gospel to our feelings about the gospel to a commitment to the gospel. And notice that over and over again Paul refers to God as my God. <laughs> Paul, that's one of my God. Let me ask you this morning, is he your God? Is Jesus your God? Is he your Savior? Have you received his righteousness by faith? Remember, salvation is not something we achieve, but it's something that we receive when we believe. Let's say that one together. Salvation is not something we achieve. But it's something that we receive when we believe. Something we receive when we believe. You see, we can't uh, ignore this, this, nor can we stop speaking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We cannot remain silent any longer. Christians, stand up. We cannot be, remain silent any longer. That's part of what's going on in this cultural war that we're in. Christians have been silent too long. We must, we must take a stand. We must speak up. We, we cannot. We must be as, as Luther. The just shall live by faith. Any, you know, our indifference has to be replaced with repentance and recommitment to share the good news of the gospel with everyone that we know and everyone that we come in contact with. Why are we ashamed at times? What are we afraid of? Rejection? Isolation? Remember the words of our Lord in Luke 9, 26. What did Jesus say? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and the holy angels. It's no small thing to shrink back from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time for us to step up as Paul. As he exhorts young Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says this, For this reason I also suffer these things. He's in prison again. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, Brother David. I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? If you're here today and you've, you're, you're teetering or you, you, you don't have the assurance of your salvation, don't walk out the, the doors without knowing that you are saved, that you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. I'll be here to talk with you if you, if you need someone to talk and pray with. If God is leading you to become part of our fellowship, we invite you to do that. You come either by a, a letter from another church, by profession of your faith and being baptized, 
for confessing faith in Christ and being baptized. Let's pray together.